Hey, it's me, the mouth of the sound, Jimmy Hart. Hey, check out my new tag team, baby, Money and the Pharaoh. Hey, Jimmy, don't forget to tell them about Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Well, you know what I would, but you already did it. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and Pharaoh show. Monty and Pharaoh, bro. Monty and the Pharaoh. The Monty and the Pharaoh. You've got the future Hall of Famer, that rocker, Marty Gennetti, MJ in the house, and I'm sitting here with two more future Hall of Famers, Monty and the Pharaoh. We're doing that stuff and we're going to rock it. Monty and the Pharaoh. It's Monty and the Pharaoh. 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 And Monty and the Pharaoh. Oh, is it Monty and the Pharaoh? Yeah. Monty and the Pharaoh. Monty and the Pharaoh. Hey, cut <laughs> music. When you want the best in professional wrestling, Long Island, there's only one place you're going to get it right here. Monty and the Pharaoh. <laughs> now, that's not just the coolest, and that's not just the best. That, my friends, is just <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Monty and the Pharaoh. Duh. I'm having a wonderful time with Monty Nefero. And I'm gonna play with the cross face chicken and he's gonna go down right now. Yeah. <laughs> hey! Not get a call off the Russian nightmare! And you're watching the number one show on Long Island with Monty and the Pharaoh. Ah! Uh, can they see <laughs> on camera who's <laughs> judging these women next to me? Like, I like girls are just lining up to be with you two. Uh, right? uh, uh, so uh, I think I'm done with you! All right, welcome to another special edition of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. Monty Nefaro on the program, none other than Hall of Famer Scott Hall. Scott Hall, thank you for joining us. Hey, yo. All right, all right. Thanks for me. I'll never forget one time when I was underneath guy in WCW, and like I think I was Gator Scott Hall or something they gave me, and uh, I think I had my hair blonde, and I was walking through the airport with behind Ric Flair, and this is late 80s early 90s and a, a grown man like an army guy a young gi came up to him holy cow rick flair man i grew up watching you and rick's you know gracious takes a picture with a guy signs autograph and i walk around flair i said flair that's a grown man i said you know what that means it means you're old <laughs> <laughs> now now i got Grown men coming to me going out going, God bless you, thank you very much. Right. And I'm from that era when nearly 40 guys from my era are dead from overdose, some intentional overdose. Because to me, if they find you in the pill bottles next to you and it's empty, then you were, you know, when they find you and you're OD'd but there's still pills in the bottle, to me that's accidental. I mean, if you're going to kill yourself, you don't say, well, I'm going to take eight. You just slam the whole bottle to me. You know, I've never been, I've been in some dark places, but never really there, you know, like, you know, I just, I wanted God to take me. I didn't want to, I didn't want heat with God, you know, because I mean, I grew up an altar boy, mm. so. Were you a fan of it growing up? Yeah, I, my dad took me and some of my buds, my dad was in the army, so I grew up army bases all over, and we lived in Fort Rucker, Alabama. My dad took me to the local indie promotion there, with three or four of my buddies for my eighth birthday. And it was a hair match. Okay. Like at eight years old, I don't remember the guys, but I still have the program. And I ran to the ring. Like they shaved the guy's head in the ring. And even at eight years old, some of my buddies are going, this stuff's all fake. And I'm going, no, it's not, man. <laughs> oh, no, you're eating it up. Would you let somebody shave your head? <laughs> and I went and grabbed a piece of the guy's hair, and it was a little piece of scalp on it. I remember going, look at that, man. Yeah. Well, tell me it's fake, you know. I was hooked then. Yeah. So what happened the day you found out it wasn't necessarily what you thought it was? What are you talking about, bro? There you go! He's the there it is. To this <laughs> day, well, it's I'm, only in. Fake. I'm in. It's, it's only fake when I lose. When I, when I win, <laughs> okay. it's real. Okay. There you go. WrestleMania 10 was a thousand percent real. Hell yeah. Excellent. So I think 
as a wrestler, the more wrestling, the better. Like more, more, um, more places to work, better. You know, like, and and they they're a lot of young guys who are, have their own kind of today's click. You know, they're the Bullet Club or the, they're the elite. What do they call themselves? But it's a bunch of guys who all get along and hang out together and talk business, like after hours. They sit around and talk business. So they came up with an idea, and I think it's great. What can they do to avoid what ultimately happened to WCW? Well, they got the they got big money behind them. I think this whole thing came about. AEW came about, obviously because young talented guys were looking for an alternative, but also by Vince. Um, saying, hey, XFL's coming again, coming again. The guy, the money guy behind AEW, the father owns the Jacksonville Jaguars. So he gave his son a couple billion, which already is more than Vince has accumulated. Here, we're in the wrestling business now. Mm. So I think the guy just said, enough of this. Enough of you. I'm going to, you want to come in my world? I'm coming in your world. Do you watch the current product? Yes. You do? Yeah. Vince yeah. too? Yeah. I wow. mean, it's hard to sit through three hours of Raw. Fair I'll admit enough. it. I mean, to me, NXT is the hottest show, be, and mainly f- because it's new guys, and it's only one and hour. And it's short. It's one hour. Yeah, extension. Yeah. It's old the, the very it's first like Raws were one hour, and they were high. I was in a Publix grocery store. I'm looking at steaks, and Barry Windham walked up next Barry to me. Barry Windham. And nice. Barry's looking at steaks, and I remember going, I said, wow, you know, I did the old, I don't want to bother you thing, but I'm a big fan, you know, and Barry Windham, and he goes, you know, and I'm a big dude. And at that time in Tampa, you know, they had college football. They had the USFL, Tampa Bay Bandits, mm-hmm. then Tampa Bay Buccaneers, mm-hmm. and then they had pro wrestlers. There was a lot of big muscle heads in Tampa at that time. And he goes, man, what do you do for a living? And I said, man, I'm trying to get into your business. And I was working out with a famous Japanese wrestler, Hiro Matsuda. And he trained Hulk, Paul Orndorff, Lex Luger, and I. And, and he said, oh, F, Hiro, he'll just have you doing Hindu squats all around the building, which was true. Hero has a record for doing 10,000 Hindu squats. It's like just free body weight squats without stopping. Oh, my God. So he said, you know where the sportatorium is? And I'm going, yeah, I'm there every Wednesday watching you guys tape TV. He goes, meet, meet me there tomorrow at like 11 o'clock. And I was there at 10. So I said, man, Barry Wyndham's got to drive to Miami tonight. He ain't coming down here. He showed up and brought Mike Rotunda with him. The first bump I ever took in a wrestling ring is I laid flat in the ring and they grabbed me around the shoulders and around the knees and lifted me up to waist high and dropped me. And then I bumped Barry while Mike watched. Then I would bump Mike while Barry watched. You know, I'm slamming these major stars. And I'm a career ender, bro. I've never touched anybody. I've been doing Hindu squats and push ups. <laughs> and uh, that was my first introduction. Back then, I didn't know that everybody knew everybody. Like, I didn't know all the boys knew each other's stuff. So, they, you know, Barry was like, yeah, we saw this big kid in the gym and this and that. And then Dusty was the boss. And next thing you know, you go from being on the outside to being in. Like, they started giving me tickets to the shows. Instead of buying them, they were giving them to me. And then I was allowed to come in the locker room, which is like, whoa, nice. you know. Do you know you were going to make it, though? Did you feel that momentum? Or did you feel like, oh, this could be a mistake? Well, I remember looking at guys who were over and going, I think I can do that. Like, I, I would go sit and watch the guys do interview, and I was thinking... I can, I think you I had can confidence. Get, well, was there I mean, a guy that was over that you were scratching your head like, I don't even know how this guy's making cash right now? No, because at that time, most of the guys who were over, like, uh, they deserved it. I mean, I was there when the horsemen were red hot. Yeah. And I'll never forget because I just saw Tully in Las Vegas. And, like, now the WWE is so politically correct, I, get, I doubt that this kind of exchange goes on anymore. But I found it really valuable to me. Like, I was on about second match, and Tully came out and said, Hey, kid, come here. He said, That one thing you did, that was really good. That other thing, that was good. Keep doing that. He goes, That other stuff, that was effing horrible. Don't ever do that again. And then he started to walk away, then he turned back around. He goes, Look, don't get it twisted. Not like I care. I just don't want you killing the crowd off before we go out. Nice. <laughs> there you go. But nice. I never forgot that. Anybody you pattern yourself after coming up in the business? Like, I want to be like this wrestler or that wrestler? Um... I always thought it was important to learn how to, to be able to wrestle. You know, like I worked in Japan a lot before I had any success in the U.S. And over there, you can't talk to the guys. And you don't have to. I mean, you may send one or two spots over with the translator. Mm-hmm. And you'll find out that if it's somewhere you come out, come out on top, they don't understand. 
when it when it's them going over, they get it the first time, mm. you know. But I just thought it was important to be able to chain wrestle because then you don't have to talk it. If you put me in a hole and I can reverse it, I'm going to reverse it. Right. And then you cut me off. And good luck holding me down because I'm not going to lay there. You know, it's. I think I liked it when everything wasn't so scripted. Mm. Like, if you're so good, prove it, bro, because I'm going to display display your ability or lack of ability, but do it in three, two, one. one. You know, <laughs> I like it being real competitive. I mean, I was the reason, by me leaving the WWE when I did, now everybody gets guaranteed money, everybody gets guaranteed schedule, like reduced schedule. They also have a non-compete thing of 90 days because I jumped and went, mm-hmm. you know, the next day. But Changed everything. They, uh... I don't know, like people say thank you to me for it, and I say you're welcome, you know. I took a lot of heat for it. Vince blamed me for leaving and blamed me for taking Kev. For 15 years, I didn't get a royalty check. Kev still got here. So when you were in the AWA, was it really the WWE? Was that the pinnacle? And people just say that because they're the only game in town now. Like, well, you know, you see these guys are like, oh, when you got to New York, that's when you know you made it. And I'm not well, so sure if that's it, a truth. Well, it was clearly a better product, and working for Vern, and Vern was good to me and paid me good and gave me national TV exposure, but he, Vern was fascinated by characters and gimmicks, but he never created one. To me, I grew up in Florida watching Dusty, and I liked that Southern style and that, and I thought that was better. So when I gave, the belt was coming my way in the AWA, and I told Vern, I'm leaving, man. Don't put it on me. Wow. I, I don't want to be captain of a sinking ship. So you knew it was sinking. I knew enough to say, well, I remember because I was around the Freebirds, and we were in Chicago one time, and it was almost sold out. Michael Hayes, Michael Hayes looked at the crowd and said, man, this place is dying. We're out of here. Smart. Yeah, Michael Smart. Hayes is a genius. He's still got a job. Let me ask you about Kurt Henning. You tag team with him. I think he helps you become a better wrestler. Oh, certainly. Did he have the drug problems back then, or was that something he gained um, as he got older? He was. I never took a, a pill till I was around Kurt. You know, I'd smoked a little bit of weed, and back then you know, I, I was still using steroids. And if you look at Kurt's, if you look at my wrestling improved during a time together, because we traveled together every day. Kurt drove every mile. Just like with Kev, some guys like to drive. It's cool with me because I like sitting in the passengers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, and look at his body by the time he became Mr. Perfect. You can see the give and take in our relationships. Mm-hmm. But I always say that Kurt was the most unselfish guy I've ever been around. Like, there was no guaranteed money. We're both baby faces. He's competing basically for the same spot. But his job is to make me look good. And he does it without any ego. And then get in a car with me and talk to him about, remember when that happened? What were you thinking? Because this is how it looked. Mm. You should do this, you know that. And I mean, if we would always sing that song, you know, New York, New York, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, New York was everybody's dream because they were blowing away. I mean, they were so hip. The TV was so cool. And Vince was the first guy to shoot in big stadiums and show it that way. Right. I mean, big arenas. Back then, they filmed in studios with two or three rows of folding metal chairs and the walls painted black. And everybody was cool with that until you see the alternative. Yeah. And that looks like big time. Oh, yeah. And it was. And it was. It was. Like, where I struggled in the AWA is I was Scott Hall in the grocery store, but I was Scott Hall in the ring. So until I had this character, this Scarface, Razor Ramon guy that I could step into, like no matter how, I might like be going through a divorce and my kids don't talk to me, and uh, but I stepped through that curtain, how you doing? Better than you. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. You like I, I just ripped off the Scarface attitude, like all I want is what I got coming to me. So let's put you in the WWE. I think one yeah. of your first major matches were against Macho Man and yeah. Randy Savage. Give me your thoughts on Savage and if you could possibly share his attitude um i don't know if elizabeth was part of that at that point and how did how did he treat elizabeth and our gorgeous george in the wcw um, was he as jealous as everybody says he was i have heard stories about match and they even put out his family even endorsed the dvd they put out where they talked about how crazy he was right. like locking her in the condo going here's 21 tv dinners yeah, right. i'll be back in a week like locking her in where she couldn't get out. And that's dangerous. I mean, what if there's a fire? Like, I got to think, what if there's a fire? But no, he was super protective of her. And this is in a time when she was the only woman in wrestling. So there was no ladies' dressing rooms. There was none of that. So he'd have to, you know, okay, everybody turn it back. Liz is coming through. There were some guys who go, hey, Liz, take a look at that. You know, like right. the boys are the boys. Right. And if they think it bothers you, then they do it more. And Randy was super intense. I remember when I was working with him. 
And this is at a time when Randy didn't put guys over, but he's putting Razor over. Mm-hmm. So did he I, script out your matches like make these long move for move he matches did, he did that with Dallas I never did that with him okay I don't want I, it's, not, it's not how Kurt taught me to work because mm-hmm. what works in New York it might not work in Atlanta you know like you have to it changes market to market yeah okay how about the Ed Ring chemistry with you and Randy how would you describe it well for me it's Randy Savage he's already a made star so, and I'm getting a big push. They did five or six weeks of vignettes that Vince personally directed. Vince flew to South Beast with me and directed them. So I know I'm getting a push, but also have the advantage of my boy Perfect being a liaison. He's already proved he's a great talent in the ring. And Vince loves him so much that they give him a, he's collecting his Lloyds of London insurance policy. So he's getting paid. And then he gets paid to be an announcer and trained by Vince. Vince is schooling him how to be an announcer. And he's at that part where he's kind of office, but he's one of the boys. Now my wife is a year pregnant. I mean, Boy. I mean, about to have a baby. Right. And I'm about to quit wrestling, but now I need a job. So I saw Diamond Dallas Page, and I said, Dally, I need a job, man. And he thinks about it, and then he starts calling me. He gave me the black hair. He gave me the stubble. He gave me the toothpick. He gave me everything. And, uh, and he I, gave and you the I, I already, He I already, gave you the toothpick. I already knew how to work. How about the, the actual name Razor Ramon? Well, I came up with that because I liked Razor. So okay. when I... Anyway, I debuted as a diamond dud, the diamond stud. Mm-hmm. That day, I get home. I have to drive back to Florida from Atlanta. I'm that low on the, on the totem pole. I get home. I got three messages from Pat Patterson. The holy cow. Now I call. Can I speak to Pat? I get right through. So Pat goes, Pat goes, hey, kid, I'm going to come right to the point. Vince loves the new look. Oh, boy. And he goes, he goes, did you sign a contract (laughs) with them sons of (laughs) And I said, Pat, I didn't want to work for them. I wouldn't have called your office every week for a year if I did. He goes, calm down, kid, calm down. He's laughing. Pat's always laughing. Calm down, French Canadian. Calm down. Calm down, down. kid. He goes, don't worry. You'll be able to tell him in a year. New York wants you. And then One year later, you're in New York. So let's jump. You, they give you this, the Intercontinental strap. With you know, growing up, the Intercontinental strap oh, meant yeah. everything. Well, that was to this like, company, back right? in that era. That was like the workers. Belt. Yeah, that was like the that, number two, that right? The, and that was that, the real guy. Well, that's the guy who can work with anybody. And then the big belt was like if you're an attraction. Yeah. So we had Tito Santana, Greg Valentine, great Intercontinental champions. Right. However, we did have Shane Douglas, who was an Intercontinental champion. Right. He kind of tells a story Dean on our show Douglas. that right. you really d- him over <laughs> well, in and, Canada. Oh, oh, oh. He, um, oh, oh. <laughs> they came to me. I worked in a tag match against the Smoking Guns with Kid, and rocked it. And then, because Sean got beat up in some club, he couldn't work with with Shane. Did he really get beat up? Yeah, oh, beat back. Really? And uh, and nobody helped him. Like, I think Davey were you Boy, there? Some, some guys were there. No, I was in a different okay. town. Okay. I think I was in Europe with Kev. Okay. And uh, who was he with? That they were just standing around going kick him again. They got stuck in the car. They got stuck in the car. Oh, yeah, whatever. Okay. So all, right. all right. All right. So bring us back to Canada. They're going to give Shane the title. Well, they give it to Shane, and then I think Gorilla orders me him to defend it against me, and they put it on me. But. Hold it. But Shane. he thinks I'm back there politicking for it, bro. I've already had it a couple times. I'm okay. you re, sometimes you reach a point where you don't need the belt. You become like yeah, more you, over than the belt. Mm-hmm. Give the belt to somebody to establish. But he, he kind of tells a story that you're sitting at a bar with him, I guess, and you say, "Hey, man, I'm gonna give you the strap," and he's all excited, but he's kind of doesn't understand why they told you he's getting it. He gets called into this dark room. Vince has like one light hanging over his head and starts talking about giving the belt. And then he goes, after you win the belt, you're going to lose it 10 minutes later. And then the light comes on and you're sitting in the corner. Doesn't this sound like a great promo? Staring at him. It at least sounds like a good promo. Yeah, it's a good story. I don't have any memory of that. But I mean... (laughs) Sounds like a good promo, though. Hey, yo. Here's my side of the story. (laughs) uh, Shane Douglas came in with a reputation as being great. Like... I was going to get him over, and he was going to rewrite wrestling history working with Shawn Michaels. Except he's little, but he's slow, and he's heavy, and he's not that athletic, and he's not that good a talker. That Dean gimmick wasn't his fault. That was put mm-hmm. on him, but that was mm-hmm. horrible. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, I think, you know, he was given the opportunity. He didn't deliver the goods, and he's bitter about it. But, I mean, I don't care. I never got along with him. I mean... It ain't show friends, it's show business, you know. We're never going to have dinner together. We're never going to travel together. It doesn't matter to me. Right. 
Right. Can I ask you about, I have to ask you about your great, great, great match, which I watched last night because I'm a freaking mark, uh, against uh, Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 10. Did you realize during the match, after the match, how quickly before you realized, whoa, this match is iconic, These, th- this is something that well, the fans I mean, are going to talk signing, to me about forever? I signed autographs two hours nonstop in Vegas. I did all the NWO stuff, and I thought I was done. Then they pulled me in another room. And for two hours, I took pictures on a ladder with the IC Jeez. belt. Get out. But actually, we'd had a few of them, so we knew even if we have our worst one, it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And everything, sometimes the ladder will fall the right way and just on its own and do something cool. It did. Yeah, it did some cool stuff on <laughs> it its sure own. It sure did. <laughs> but I remember, my memories of that are like when we when we go home, you know, I, I grab both belts, boom, I take a bump, put them laying there, and people are popping. Mm-hmm. And we know we've gone over a little bit. And we know that Mach and Crush are behind us. And they're going to do some little thing, fight around, but we're cutting into their time. I'm well aware of that. But with that ladder match, it's kind of thing, once you put it in motion, you can't speed it up or slow it down. Yeah. So and then now I'm laying there, and then I hear Sean tell Baby Earl, the ref, tell Ray's to climb the ladder with the belts. So that's, that's what I did. So that's that's a, there's two iconic photos. One of Sean splashing me, which they show on their TV all the time, by mm-hmm. the way. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've signed some of those today at the signing. I have to remind people, you know I won this match. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, right, right, right. <laughs> but then there's the one of me with the two belts. And that's all Sean, because to me, people criticize us all the time. Oh, they're holding people down. They're selfish. No, that's my boy going, no, get your moment, bro. Mm-hmm. Like Vince calls it, your WrestleMania moment. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. When do you first form your friendship with Kevin Nash? We were both mid-card jabronis. I'm the diamond dud, and he's Oz. And he's already been through about three gimmicks. And and Oz is making twice what the diamond stud makes and can't do a thing. It's not his fault. He just never had any matches. He had a mask on his head, too. Oh, it was brutal. So (laughs) so bad. They spent so much money on the costume, and it was so heavy. The cape was made out of, like, old movie theater curtain like heavy and stuff and they gave him a big trunk to travel with like now you gotta get there way early and check this thing and I'm like whose idea was it to make him Oz please Dusty it was Dusty yeah I horrible Dusty sorry yeah yep. bad bad how about this one then oh, Nia hit Jax it. hit it you're hitting it yeah. oh yeah please like, explain this one please bro. explain this no she's cool man you ever met her she's I, no cool. I've never met her I'm not like, Scott to me, Hall to me like sometimes personality goes a long way man oh damn, damn. Yeah, did you ever see oh, pictures of her when she was young what? Yeah, of course. Yes. She used to be yes. hot as I hell. Agree. So she's, I there's agree. still that hottie inside there. Interesting. Nice. Okay. Very All right, Alicia Fox. That's from I hit it for sure. She's, is she hot? She, she is so. Okay. And the thing is, she's so cool. You know, like. Why isn't she getting a push? What's the deal with that? Yeah, what's going on? Well, she doesn't help herself much. She. Oh. I mean, uh, like, I, I was talking to Liv Tyler the other day. Like, we were messaging back and forth, and I said. Because they broke her off from that group she was with, and she's on her own mm-hmm, now. Mm-hmm. I said, I said, listen, both your partners work strong, and you come in, and everybody gets everything on you. I said, you got to change that. You got to have some moves and do them all the time. Start doing it. Do it now, you know. And and I think that's Alicia's problem too. She doesn't have a move set, and sometimes you have to be a little selfish. Like, no, I'm getting my stuff in first, then you do your stuff. Like. I don't know. Do they ever approach you about being part of the writing team and helping the talent? I mean, you've got a great mind for the business. How about I've been NXT told that a lot. Sean? I would rather be there and work with the big guys. How about down in the NXT Like, no Sean? one's teaching. They got a few big guys down there now, and there's no big guys teaching them how to work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Charlotte Flair? I know she's Flair's girl. girl. No, I just mean, I go so back so long with Rick, I've just got to say out of respect, like, Quit it. You know? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you ain't touching oh, that one. I go way yeah. back with Rick. By the way, greatest woman wrestler in the history of professional I think so. wrestling. Right there? I think yes. so. Uh, easily. Yeah. Easily. Easily. How do you nice. like the women's product right now? It's the women. A little, I, a little overblown? In my era, there was only one or two women that wrestled. <laughs> now, the women are a strong part of it. And even in my era, the women traditionally worked harder than the guys. Really? Now? Because they had heat. Like, man, you don't draw. Really? Nobody's here to see you. It's just like when the midgets come in. Man, nobody's here to see you. You're a novelty mm-hmm. act. You're taking money out of my pocket, you know. And the girls would go out there and work harder. Would people dare give moolah an attitude back in the day? I was never around moolah. I, I was before not. my time. Interesting. Okay. Kamala. What? Why yeah, on earth would he hit, hit Kamala? Throw, throw Kamala? What the hell? There. Brother, I worked with Kamala and... When they were turning Razor, like after I'd been beat by Kid and he sold the money, 
So I was on like second, third matches. We're against Kamala, and he's a babyface. Right. And the people are chanting one, two, three. And, uh, <laughs> and he would do this thing where he'd stick oh, yeah. his hand out, and he'd go like that. And people go, no, no. I'd go like, you know, I'm just doing an opening match stuff. Like, shake my hand. People go, no. And he's, he's looking at the people, and he goes, Razor, I know you're going to kick me. <laughs> I know you're going to kick me. And like, I mean, he's so talented. It's so sad what happened to him. And that right. diabetes... Yeah, a lot of people, man. It's a lot of it's diet related. And yeah, if you're sure. not watching what you eat, everything that stuff will get a hold of you. Listen, real quick. Do you think Vince has a responsibility mm. to taking care of the old professional wrestlers? I'm going to echo what Vince say, says and say no, because until they until they make a fundamental change, you're an independent contractor, and it's better for him that way. And if the lowest paid guy in the, in the company's getting paid pretty good, it's kind of up to you to handle your money. You know, I mean, I don't, and until they change it, and I don't see it happening, it's going to be the way it is. So, adapt or get left behind. You're still a millionaire? Yeah. So, why do you do this? I like getting out of the house. There you go. Hit it for sure. Kong? What? Oh, yeah. She's Kong? a sweetheart. You're hitting Kong? Have you ever met her? She's what a sweetheart. What the hell is Kong? Well, she's Look a sweetheart. I'm so confused. Correct, my friend. I didn't realize this. He's not being, I think he's being honest. What's not No, she's not. I a think he would woman. hit it. What are you talking you about? Look, are you catching like, close here? Look not, uh, can they see <laughs> on camera who's judging these women next to me? Like, Damn, like girls are just lining up to be with you two. Right? Wait, oh, so I think I'm done with you. Damn. Damn. That, hook me up again. Bro.